Well, hey everyone, how we doing today? That was a little bit lame. All right, that's a little better. Welcome to CCV. We are so glad that you're here, whether you're joining us in the room or you're joining us online. Um, I love these times. You can probably notice it looks a little different up here. I, I love these weekends where we just get to strip it down a little bit and get to hear you a little bit more than we typically do. I uh, just want to introduce some of my friends. This is my friend Blake over here on the keys. Oh, claps. Hold on, hold on, though, because probably the thing you need to know about Blake is he's a Miami Heat fan. But that is the only bad thing that I could possibly say about him. Uh, this is my friend Brad, who's playing bass. Cool story about Brad. Brad has been a part of this church for 26 years, and he has been playing on our team for 26 years. Yep. Uh, this is my friend Hannah. Hannah uh, grew up at CCB, came up through our student ministry. Uh, and cool fact about Hannah, she's getting married to somebody on our team this week. So if you see Hannah afterwards, make sure to congratulate her. Uh, I want to invite you to stand with us. Um, we're going to sing a few songs here in a minute. And as you might know, it is St. Patrick's Day weekend. And despite what you typically might think of when you think about St. Patrick, he, he is a saint for a reason. He's a very important person uh, in the life of our faith. And I just want to read this prayer uh, that he wrote. It's called Prayer for the Faithful. Uh, before we get started, before we sing together, it says this. I just invite you to just listen in. It says, may the strength of God guide us. May the power of God preserve us. May the wisdom of God instruct us. May the hand of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the shield of God defend us. May the angels of God guard us against the snares of the evil one. May Christ be with us. May Christ be before us. May Christ be in us. Christ be over all this day, O oh Lord, and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together. I want the melodies I sing to be dangerous. More than empty words and empty phrases So let our praises be released from their cages When I sing this hallelujah, he hears it I'm shouting every word for a reason So hear me now in holy defiance I'm echoing the roar the lion Come on, sing it out Hallelujah Fear's got no hold on us Cause he is the light of Judah And his roar is my triumph yeah. And I'm going to the land that he'll show me I'm burning all the ships, no retreating Cause my father's on the moon, he's dangerous When I shout this hallelujah, he hears it I'm chasing after him every season With nothing left, I'm holy, relying Living in the pride of the lion Come on Life ain't safe, but he's good. Oh no, life ain't safe, but he's good. No, it ain't safe, but he's good. In the wild, he's good. And in the fire, he's good. Safe, but he's good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Fear's got no hold on us. Cause he is the light of Judah. His glory is my triumph. The light of Judah and his roar is my triumph. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fear's got no hold on us. Cause he is the light of Judah. His roar is my triumph. His roar, His roar is my triumph. His roar is my triumph. Yeah. You 
throw up my hands I'll praise you again and again It's all that I have is a Sing it out Hallelujah And I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah Amen Cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me And I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body bowed and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb At the entrance sea by heavy stone Messiah still in all the world We sing Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. No. The food I break on song the son of hell in rose of hell in old triple death. Where is your sting? The angels roll for Christ the King. Oh, yeah. in Praise the name of the Lord our God. He will praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. And He shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my case transfixed on jesus face oh, praise and oh praise the name of the Lord our God in your praise His name forevermore oh, for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord oh Lord our oh, God oh praise the name oh praise the name of the Forevermore, 
Let's pray. Father, it is, it is a privilege to gather in this space praising your name and showing and singing about our gratitude, the fraction of the gratitude that we have. Lord, may our worship not just be the words that we sing and say, but may it be the lives that we live. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for singing. You can be seated. I want to welcome you all again to CCV. My name is Travis Brown. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. And I just love that song that we just sang because it paints a picture of what Jesus did for us that makes it worthy, makes him worthy of our praise. But let's be honest, we, we praise a lot of different things in our lives, some deserving, some not so deserving. But we often praise people for amazing accomplishments or kind gestures or even acts of bravery. And all those things are, are great, but if I'm honest, and sometimes it's easier for me to praise people for what I see and what I observe. It's easier for me to do that than it is for me to praise the God of the universe for what he did for me because I can't see it. But Jesus is worthy of our praise, not just because of who he is and what he did, but what he provided for us. See, we praise the name of Jesus because no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you're currently going through, there's hope to be found in a God who so desperately wants you to experience life with him that he was willing to send his one and only son to this earth as a ransom for you to be rescued. That is worthy of our praise. And every single week, we continue our worship by doing something that Jesus himself gave for us to do when we gather together, and that is take communion together. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23 says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right now, I wanna invite all followers of Jesus to participate in communion as we take the bread and the juice that remind us of what Jesus did that made it possible for us to experience hope and forgiveness and life. And just like, just like that verse says, when we take the bread, we're reminded of his body that was beaten and tortured and hung on a cross for you. When we take the juice, we're reminded of his blood that he poured out while hanging on that cross as a payment for all of our sins. But listen, if, if you're here today and you don't even know what you believe about Jesus, maybe you're just checking us out, maybe you're on the, on, the, on the fence, I want you to know you've come to the right place. There's no expectation that you participate in communion, but I do want you to know something. He did that for you too. So let's use these next few moments to, to praise Jesus for who he is as he's the only one worthy of our praise. Father, thank you for bringing us to this moment, to this space where we can put all our focus, all our worship on you. Thank you for going to the cross with us in mind. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Jonah 3.10 and Jonah 4. God saw what they had done, that they had turned away from their evil lives. He did change his mind about them. What he said he would do to them, he didn't do. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead, God said. What do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad leaf tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up, but then God sent a worm. By dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about the shade tree? Jonah said, plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. God said, what's this? How is it that you could change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I, likewise, change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong to say nothing of all the innocent animals. It was March the 2nd, 1944. It was a rain-soaked evening in Balvano, Italy. And it was the site of one of the worst train disasters of all time. But it wasn't because a, a car came onto the tracks. It wasn't because the tracks were switched and two oncoming, uh, an oncoming train collided with another one. It wasn't because of a natural disaster. What happened was the train stalled and it came to a stop on a slight incline. Now, that wouldn't be a problem except for where it was stalled, and that was in the midst of a long tunnel. And this tunnel was so tight that the carbon monoxide began to emit throughout that whole area in that tightly contained uh, area. And what happened was it settled in. Now, freight trains back then in 1944 uh, were led by an engineer at the very front and an engineer at the very back. But in 1944, they couldn't communicate with one another. An investigation that was done later found uh, that it was a result of low-grade coal that caused it to stop on that long incline. But really, all that needed to happen was for them to put the train in reverse and to go back out of the tunnel or to muster enough strength to go forward just a little bit to get them out of the tunnel. But what they found after this terrible tragedy was this investigation showed that the front person, the front engineer, had his throttle full speed ahead while the engineer in the back had his wanting to go in reverse. 517 people died because two people could not decide which direction to go. The book of Jonah is all about directions. In the past four weeks, we've been in a series where Jonah, a reluctant prophet of God, has been in reverse at times. You'll remember he started out in Joppa and God sent him to Nineveh, but instead of going to Nineveh, he went the opposite direction to Tarshish. In fact, in chapter one, Jonah moves from God. Chapter two, Jonah moves toward God. Chapter three, he preaches and others move toward God. And in chapter four, spoiler alert, he's gonna move away from God again. And it will underscore everyone's need for God's grace. 
So let's walk through this passage together. As we wrapped up Jonah chapter 3, he's, he's preached repentance and turning to God or else God is going to destroy the city. And then something unusual and unexpected happens. The preaching gets to the king and the king changes his direction in his mind. And he orders a fast from food for everyone and that they're to give up their evil ways, to plead with this unknown God, this God of Jonah's, for a second chance. And against all odds, the God of Jonah made good on grace. It was unprecedented. It was unexpected. It was undeserved mercy that God gave. So, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. A spiritual revival is born, and God graciously gives them a second chance. Now, for a preacher, this is absolutely, there's nothing as fulfilling as seeing people respond to the gospel message and and turn to God. You know it wasn't you, but you're thrilled that God would use you as a conduit to help people understand and experience God's grace. So, let's see how excited Jonah is about what's happened after his preaching. Verse 1. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Now, we'd love it if people called us merciful and compassionate But Jonah's not saying those things as a compliment. The Ninevites were lost. This city had been moving in the opposite direction on the track from God for quite some time. They were so deep in their sins that their conscience had been seared. Their hearts had become so hardened over time that they moved farther and farther from God. And Jonah is mad about them coming to God. Yeah, I thought that that's what we want when we preach. But not to Jonah. His disdain for the Ninevites was greater than his passion for reaching the lost. Sometimes we think that God only has enough grace to embrace godly people, or we think it must be earned, and if God just gives it away, it somehow invalidates our efforts to be worthy of God. Or whatever the reason, Jonah's response is not what we expected from a prophet of God. I mean, to be mad about people being forgiven and saved... Now, we wouldn't be as extreme or as blatant as what Jonah was, but for us, maybe it looks like this. It's a co-worker who, for the first time, is showing signs of being open to a spiritual conversation. In fact, they initiate it, but it's at five minutes until five o'clock, and you're trying to get to the club to get that workout in. Or think of it this way. Instead of being excited about the growth at your CCB campus that you attend, now you start to complain when you pull in and say, you know what, it's tougher to find a good parking spot for me now. So before we judge Jonah, let's realize that we can be hot and cold ourselves. We have moments of spiritual depth followed by moments of spiritual despair. We had our three-year-old grandson at our home for several days this past week. He is one of the funniest kids that you will ever meet, and on Sunday morning, uh, he said, he just announced in the middle of the living room, he said, I want to go to church so that I can learn about Jesus, and Beth and I looked at each other and thought, oh, he's an angel. (laughs) Well, a few hours later, I asked him to do something, and he just looked back at me and said, no, no. And my wife, Beth, turned and gave him a look. And when she looked at him, his eyes began to well up. And he slowly looked back at her and said, I don't like your face. (laughs) In three hours' time, he went from an angel to a Ninevite, all right? Uh, Now, when he said, I don't like your face, we both knew what he was trying to say in his three-year-old mind, all right? He was trying to say, I don't like when you look at me like that. And he's been around the the block enough to know that look. And I wanted to say to him, buddy, she she scares me too. Uh, 
But he teared up because his conscience began to work on him when he disobeys or when he disrespects. And it was a teachable moment for us to help the little guy begin to learn how repentance leads to forgiveness. But if we are being honest, we realize that we can all be rather fickle in our faith and inconsistent in our actions. Look at Jonah chapter four, verse three. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will, will not happen. So uh, another translation says, therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Can't you hear him saying it in such dramatic tones? Any of you have a child or a grandchild that is a drama queen? Yeah. Uh, how many of you all have a, a close friend or family member? No, don't put your hands up. All right. They might be sitting beside you, right? But Jonah is a drama king. He is an adult throwing a temper tantrum before the God of all creation. And the Lord replies to him after he says, just kill me, Lord. Look at verse four. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? You ever asked a rhetorical question in hopes that when the other person states their case out loud, that it will sound so ridiculous to them that it will actually change their mind? Nineveh repents and Jonah is hacked off. And he just leaves his conversation with God. He's, he's running away again. Look at verse five. But Jonah just left in the middle of this conversation with God. He just leaves. He went out of the city to the east. He sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. He wants to know, okay, what's going to happen to Nineveh? God arranged for a broad leaf tree to spring up. It, it grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. And Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. The message paraphrase says that God arranged this to happen. The New International Version says the Lord God appointed a plant just as he appointed a big fish to swallow Jonah. He, he caused the plant to grow so quickly that it provided shade for Jonah at this place that he set up, his own little private cabana that he had. And he sits there without a care in the world. Life was looking up, but look at verse seven. But then God sent a worm. And by dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. And the sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he started to faint. And he, once again, prayed to die. I'm better off dead. So now God appoints a worm to destroy the shade, a strong wind, and blazing sun. Get this. God will use anything at his disposal to get his point across. God will use anything in order to get your attention. And Jonah says, I'm, I'm, I'm better off dead. Well, that's pretty extreme to go from this incredible feeling to now all of a sudden, just because you're sunburned and you have chapped lips, you want to die. You ever get frustrated or, or mad at God for petty, insignificant reasons? I, I can't believe it rained on the day of our big party. It doesn't rain for weeks, God, and now you send rain on the day I have my party. Or I pray to God, I tie to the church, and yet I still didn't get their promotion at work. Come on, God, are you up there? Or she finally agreed to go out with me, Lord, and now I'm on the schedule to work the next two weekends. Come on, help me out. Or Lord, Kyler Murray's healthy now. Can you please send us some receivers to catch what he throws? Back with Jonah, there's a pattern that's emerging. He wants things his way, and if he doesn't get his way, he blows a gasket and he pouts. Everything is about him. His personal comfort was more important than a godless city turning to God. Here's takeaway number one. If God's main thing isn't your main thing, then you can get triggered by anything. It can be small, it can be large, it doesn't matter. If your agenda is different than God's, or if your desires differ from his will, 
It will be a constant tug of war that will result in frustration and anger rather than humility and service. And the book of Jonah continues to remind us of that truth. And when we make ourselves the focus, life gets out of focus. And we become more concerned with building our empire than building his kingdom. I read the book of of Jonah, I should say the page of Jonah, several times the past few weeks. And it's, it's really easy for us to trash Jonah for his disregard for this city that is spiritually lost. I mean, he's a prophet of God. Who, who, who doesn't want to pastor or preach to people who are lost? And in my sermon preparation, I was having a hard time just even grasping how a, a pastor could be so disconnected from this pastoral heart that would call you into ministry. And I was, I was working on this very sermon in Kentucky on Tuesday. My wife, my wife said, hey, uh, I just got a text message from a number I don't know and from somebody that I, I, I've never met before but they are asking if you would go to a hospital and pray with a a man who was going to be taken off of a ventilator and it looks like he'll be passing away soon. And I I still get calls like this frequently and when I was a senior pastor at this church in Kentucky, I rarely got to do those things but I'd always try to find someone from staff to to go and to to make a touch and, and to be there. But I stepped down over four years ago so I can't, as the has-been, just call up my old church and tell someone to to drive to the hospital just because I'm busy. And in my defense, you should know that Tuesdays are very important writing days and preparation days for, for, for most pastors. And I was already feeling very behind on my sermon, and I also had a to-do list that was a mile long. And my wife looked at me, and she said, why don't you do it? And I wanted to say, why don't you do it? Uh, <laughs> I wanted to say that. I did not say that. I said, babe, I said, this is, this is the worst possible day to take a couple of hours. But I agreed to call up this, this daughter-in-law of this gentleman and kind of feel out the situation. And I called her and talked to her, and she said, hey, he wants you to do his funeral. He really enjoys your preaching. Can, can you come today? And I paused, and I'm I'm thinking about this whole series of running from Nineveh. And ever so reluctantly, I I say, I I think I can swing by for a few minutes, but I probably won't be able to do the funeral because of my upcoming travel schedule. And she said, I hope you can get here while he's still able to hear you speak to him and pray with him. So I just left all of my sermon prep stuff on my desk. Now, you would think that at this point, my pastoral heart would kick in. But on my 30-minute drive down there, I actually became more frustrated because of traffic and then parking issues. I went to the wrong building. Finally, I was allowed to go back in the ICU area. And here is his family in this room, and they're all emotional because he'd been taken off of the ventilator. He had tubes everywhere. He's unable to talk. He has an oxygen mask on. I visited with them for a few minutes And when he heard my voice, he opened his eyes and he got excited and he began trying to talk, which he he, he couldn't talk with the mask and the tubes. But his excitement set up the machines beeping and I I just felt sorry for him. I, I, I talked to him for a few minutes. I talked some more to the family and then we circled up and and I said, Let's let's hold hands and and I want to pray. You know, all I can say is that while I was praying, we just kind of had this moment in that room. And at one point while I was praying, I just, I just opened my eyes for a second. And when I opened my eyes, a tear rolled off on my cheek and it landed on this gentleman's forearm. And as I was on the elevator leaving, all I could think of was, God, I almost missed out on that moment. Had I done what the flesh wanted to do rather than than listening to what God wanted me to do? And I'm thankful for a God, for that God gave me a wife who has this this gift of discernment and, and helps me and guides me. I drove home and I went to my office in my basement and I returned to working on this message. And when I picked up my laptop to work on it, beneath it, 
was uh, a note that I have scotch taped to my desk. It's been there for three years. I see it 20 times a day. It's such a regular fixture that I don't really even see it anymore. But when I lifted up the laptop, it was right there. It says, it's one thing to love to preach, but do you love the people you're preaching to? And it was like the Lord was saying, I called you into ministry 40 years ago. So don't get frustrated when your planned schedule gets interrupted by the plans that I have for you. It was God's way of reminding me not to allow the platform to become more important than the people. And when we are obedient to what God calls us to do, to go to the Ninevehs of this world, there is a high like no high you have ever experienced. And I wonder how many times I've had an attitude or a spirit that's been a barrier to someone coming to Jesus Christ and experiencing God's amazing grace. I wonder how many times I've been to Jonah. Look at verse nine. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. Really, Jonah? I mean, dude, come on. God saves you, saves your life with this big fish that swallows you. He gives you the story that hands down at any party the rest of your life will beat anyone else's story at the party, right? This same Jonah, prophet of God, instead of celebrating God's mercy, gets hacked off at God about a sunburned bald spot. And we read that and it sounds so fickle and so immature. Because it is. But that's why we need the Lord. And that's why there was divine intervention. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son. Whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. That's why God sent his son to us. is so that we could receive his grace. We desperately need God's grace because we're all gonna blow it. Romans chapter three, verse 10. There is no one righteous, not even one. Romans chapter three, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, we, we get on Jonah that he's mad that the Ninevites, his enemies, are saved. And we would say, we want all people to be saved too. But what about when it's your enemy? What about when it's that person that has done you so wrong? Do you want that person to be saved? And that's what Jonah's wrestling with, which leads us to our second takeaway. God's grace is the greatest gift. Maybe that's why Amazing Grace is one of the most popular songs of all time, even among those who are not believers. Let others in on the grace that you have received. Be grateful for God's grace over and over again. Look at verse 10. God said, what's this? Remember, he says he wants to die again. What's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I, likewise, change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong. And what God is pointing out to him through this analogy of what he's done with this plant is this. Jonah, you did not plant it, water it, tend it, or prune it. Jonah, you didn't do jack squat. It's not your plant. This is not your doing. This is my doing. It's my prerogative. And God says that is true whether it is a small plant or whether it is a large planet. Whether it is a tiny village or whether it's a huge city like Nineveh. In other words, Jonah, I sent you to give direction to Nineveh, the city of blood. That was its nickname because it was so violent. I sent you to give direction to these people who are in desperate need of having a relationship with me. Their salvation is a good thing, Jonah. This isn't a bad thing. Now, the people of this violent and decadent city had become so numb and their hearts were so hardened and they were so spiritually clueless until God sent Jonah and his 
preaching pierced their hearts. And touched by God's spirit, they make this about face and they change the direction that they're going on the tracks. Before that, they just didn't realize, they just didn't understand that they were heading toward destruction. They had become so numb to it. Last March, after a long day of travel, I had a late night mental lapse and I, I left my laptop on a plane in Baltimore. And before I had even pulled away from the rental car place, I'd already called the airlines and turned in a lost and found request. I did everything I could to get it back before anyone learned of my absent-mindedness. But after a couple of days, I had to explain to friends and family why I was without that silver slender machine that is my frequent companion. I thought my family members and close friends would be sympathetic to my honest mistake, but they were downright brutal to me. How in the world could you forget your computer on a flight? And I thought I gave them pretty convincing reasons, but they openly mocked me with their insensitive comments, calling me Mr. Magoo, <laughs> the absent-minded preacher. My family and friends even stooped so low as to start calling me Dementia Dave. <laughs> hey, it didn't matter that my grandmother had dementia and my dad had it, now they're claiming that I had it. And while God is gracious and merciful and abounding in love, evidently my family and friends are not. <laughs> and the only encouragement that I received was they were all quite certain that the airlines would find my laptop and return it to me. Well, after about 14 days, I gave up hope. I had to break down, get a new laptop. I have someone reload over 4,000 Word documents. It was just embarrassing, it was such a hassle. I wasn't as confident as my buddies that I'd ever see that laptop again. But fast forward 10 months later, <laughs> a couple months ago, January 1st, I had flown here into Phoenix late the night before to attend the Fiesta Bowl with my son. And halfway through the game, I got a text message from the woman who helps with all of my IT and computer issues. And she wrote, I just got a, a weird voicemail here in the IT office saying that they have found your laptop. But I wanted to see if it was a scam because it, it sounded a, a little sketchy. I replied, oh, that's the one. I lost it 10 months ago. I can't believe they found it. Yes, yes, call them back. I was elated. But in her next message, she texted me and she said, yes, it was an airline calling saying that they found it on a plane in Phoenix. And I thought, oh, that's strange. I lost it in Baltimore 2,000 miles away. What are the odds that they would find it in Phoenix? I, I, I flew into Phoenix last night. <laughs> Oops, I did it again. <laughs> Oh my, it was the sickest feeling in my stomach that I've ever had. There I sat surrounded by tens of thousands of sports fans, and yet I felt like I was in my own little private Alzheimer's unit. <laughs> I was half relieved, but I was half embarrassed. I couldn't wait for the game to end just to get that laptop in my grasp. And, and I went to the to Sky Harbor and they gave it to me and I was elated and I tried to hug the lady and she said, no, I'll just take it, all right? <laughs> Crisis averted. I, I want you to try to put yourself in my shoes when I started getting those text messages and when reality sunk in of my repeat performance. One minute before, I had been having the time of my life, enjoying the game without a care in the world. Why? Because I was oblivious to my own dilemma. You see, when it came to my laptop, I didn't know it was lost until it was found. And if you think about it, that is a perfect description of the Ninevites. And that's why God sent this reluctant prophet named Jonah to turn their hearts toward God, to save them. Where sin abounds, grace abounds. And they were spiritually clueless. And God knew that they were ripe for the picking. I didn't know it was lost 
until it was found. It's also a description of what will happen with some who are in your friendship circle or workplace. They won't realize what they were saved from until they swallow their pride and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and receive his amazing grace. That's, that's why we plant seeds. That's, that's why we invite as many people as we can to come to an Easter service. Every campus has so many different opportunities, and you probably have seen these, these Easter invite cards, and they're at every single one of our, our lobbies. You can pick them up on your way out today, and I hope you just share these with people just to, to get them thinking. This is the easiest invite that you will have the entire year, and people are open to this. So plant some seeds. Let me just say for those of you like me who have been Christians for for a long time, I I just want to give you a warning, and I say this to myself. Satan would love to get you feeling superior because of your spirituality or proud because of your religiosity. And he would love for you to look at your carnal coworker and shake your head at how lost they are. He'd love to get you to the point where you have little to no interaction with non-believers. And in those moments when you start to feel like you are better than others, I just pray that it will remind you that, that maybe that's a sign that you have not owned up to your own sin. And maybe you just don't realize how desperate, how desperate you were or you are for Jesus Christ in your life and what your life would be without him, and how you needed him so badly. You know, Isaiah chapter 64, verse six, says that compared to God, our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So please don't look down with a spiritual air or a smug piety or or with a false humility. Remember, Jesus saves his harshest criticism for the religious leaders of his day. And sometimes we can look at those who have not embraced faith or who openly reject Christ, and we can see them as the enemy. They are not the enemy. They are victims of the enemy. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is against the powers and principalities of this dark world. And God's message to the Ninevites 2,800 years ago is the same message I think God would want to deliver to the United States of America today. Repent and turn to me because the time is short, which leads us to our final takeaway. Takeaway number three, God's grace is greater than all your past mistakes. You say, how do you know that? I know that because Romans chapter eight, verse one. Paul writes this, he says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, it can all make sense when it comes to your imperfections being forgiven by a perfect God. Grace has a way of sneaking up on you. And when it comes to the forgiveness of sin, many are unaware of the good news of what took place at the cross. They they don't know that they're lost until they're found. Well, I want you to see what happens next. Look at Jonah chapter four, Verse 12. Oh, well, I'm sorry, there's no verse 12. That's the end of the book. It ends with verse 11. There there is no verse 12. You won't see it in the Bible, but you will see it in the mirror. So why why would God end the story at this particular point? Well, here's why. I think it's because Jonah was a recipient of God's grace again and again. And this time it wasn't by a fish saving him. Instead, this time it was by God giving him a second chance and forgiving him of his terrible attitude that he had. And I think that God changed him dramatically. Or maybe it's because when when I take a look at Jonah chapter four and I read that, I I can get discouraged. And I see 120,000 people coming to God and I say, boy, how, how could God use him to do that? And so God, in his infinite wisdom, includes the story of Jonah, this hot and cold servant who is angry one day and wants things his way, and then the next day he's preaching to the masses. You know what? I can relate to a person like that because, to be totally honest, there are so many times where I feel like my walk with the Lord lacks consistency. 
Obviously, Jonah changed. And if you come back next week, we will conclude the series on Jonah by looking at the New Testament passage that sheds some more light on Jonah that you may have never heard before. Some of you may feel like the angel inside of you and the Ninevite inside of you are trying to pull the drain, train in two different directions. May I encourage you to listen to the spirit and not the flesh. God had Jonah write the book of Jonah because God changed his heart. He doesn't offer anywhere in these four chapters any overwhelming positive qualities about himself, although I'm sure he had some. Not one positive statement about himself. He doesn't paint a picture of a grandiose season of victory in his life. Instead, he paints a picture of a selfish, angry, rebellious man. And he's humble in what he writes. And instead of doing what others might do, he paints an honest, embarrassing, realistic picture of his lack of faith. He highlights his failures more than his successes. So I read this story. And I think, if God can use Jonah then maybe he can use me. And maybe he can use you. And maybe he can use us for him and for the valley. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, forgive us when we don't have that passion for everyone who is lost to come to Christ. Take us back to when we first fell in love with you and accepted you and said, I I want you to be the master of my life. Lord, would you help us when we are inconsistent and wishy-washy in our faith? And instead, would you give us through your Holy Spirit that consistency of constantly wanting to do your will rather than ours? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.